Thanks. All right, here's our disclaimer. Um, these, uh, these views don't represent any employer or customer or, or really <coughs> anyone. And we really don't take responsibility. And, but we do ask you to take some responsibility in your drinking. We, we may not even do that. So it's great. All right, so what's a bad USB? Well, <clears throat> USBs are pretty cool, nice little storage devices, but they're a lot more than that. So it's really a mini computer, and uh, you can use it to gain physical access. Uh, of course, you don't need credentials. So, like I was saying, it's a tiny computer, and it has firmware, okay? And because of that, you can figure out how to do things with it. The important thing to note, though, is that the architecture, it, it doesn't really validate any of the, any of the you know, communication between the two devices. Uh, only to the extent that it validates it if it works and you can, and you can transmit. Uh, because of that, any, you can really use it to inject anything, and that's kind of the point of the rubber ducky. Steve's going to go more into that in a little while, and then we'll get more into how do you build these things. Okay. So, wow, I seem really, really loud. Hopefully my remote works and we can, I can wander around. Um, so really, the, the difference between the bad USB and the rubber ducky, does everybody here know what the rubber ducky is? So I see a few people not raising their hands, so I'm going to explain it briefly. So rubber ducky was designed for this purpose. It actually has components on it to slide a micro SD card in and out, utilizing it for this purpose of injecting malware, injecting things into a host PC. How that differs from bad USB is bad USB is taking an off-the-shelf product, manipulating its original intended purpose to achieve the same result. So you're injecting that malware directly into it. It looks innocuous. It doesn't look like there's anything wrong with it. It could look like the one that you took home last night if we choose to make it look that way. So it, it, it totally looks like an off-the-shelf product. You, you, it doesn't look like it's going to have anything wrong with it. it. You know, it doesn't have the rubber duct sticker or anything. So, a lot of people think it's Windows only. It's actually not. It's USB universal. It happens in Windows, Mac, or Linux. They're all vulnerable. So, why do we care? Who can go through the day without using USB. Every single person uses USB all day, every day. When I contacted a couple of manufacturers, uh, this was a legitimate response. I cut and pasted it right from what they responded to. They say that it's theoretical exploit, that it cannot be practiced. As we all know, it can happen any day, any time. We, it's beyond theoretical. So the more we talk about it, the more we get it out there, everything, the more they have to address it. Somebody needs to make changes that can make USB secure. So for this particular demonstration, what do we need? We need a USB thumb drive with the FIs on PS2251-03 NAND. The 07 is out. Uh, the 07 is actually more prevalent uh, right now because of uh, uh, the attention that we've been giving this and everything. They phased out the 03 and have been putting in the 07. But of course, we're already working on reverse engineering the 07 so that we can do the same thing. So here is a Patriot. Uh, XT supersonic USB 3.0 device that we took apart. This one comes apart really well uh, because it has a plastic case inside the rubber shell. Uh, you can peel it back in just a few seconds and it goes back together 
extremely quick and, and it looks perfect when you put it back together. So here it is uh, out of its shell and this is what you're dealing with here, the Fizon chip. This is the exact model of the Fizon chip. Now if you get a Toshiba, they will actually say Toshiba instead of Fizon, but it's exactly the same chip. There's absolutely no difference uh, in the, 20, the PS2251-03. So why has Fizon been singled out? Because Fizon gave away their entire schematics for everything on a public internet. It was out there, available, of course, we read it. That's where we start. Any penetration starts in just reading their website. So, the Fizon burner images. If you'll notice, this page is in Russia. The Russians are way far ahead of us as far as hacking the Fizon. Most of the information is in Russian. You have to go then translate it and bring it over. So, Adam and Brandon took this a step further. Uh, they, they presented this talk at DerbyCon uh, this last year, and they took it a step further by creating tools. So they made the tool DriveCom. DriveCom communicates with the drive, with the NAND itself. It will pull the old firmware. You can actually go through your batch of, of USB drives now. Uh, you know, I buy 50 here, 50 there, 50 here. And then I, instead of having to disassemble them to see what Fizon chip is in there, now I can just shove it in. Run DriveCon. DriveCon tells me, yep, that's good. Goes in this pile. Nope, that's not. Goes in that pile. I can go through 100 in a matter of just a few minutes instead of having to dissect each and every one of them to find what chip it has in it. I've now narrowed it down. DriveCon also can pull the original firmware off put the customized firmware back on, all within the one application. So they also provided a tool to build a custom firmware. It's a little more than a batch script, but, or excuse me, yeah, a batch file. Um, and it does, it pulls the things and builds the custom firmware, which you can then embed the payload, which is another tool they provide. So embed the payload, where do you get the payload? It's just simply a ducky script. We're just recycling something that we already have and starting to use it in a different manner. So we take our ducky script, and I, I had intended to have a couple of devices that we could do some demonstration, but I bricked them last night. Went just a little too far, trying to get the 32 and the 64 bit in there at the same time. So ducky script, use the duck encoder, gives you your inject.bin. Take the inject.bin, put it, embed it using the embed payload right into your custom firmware, and you're there. If you want to build these tools yourself, you're going to have to set up Visual Studio, and you're going to need Java to run the, the duck encoder. But you don't have to, because it's already compiled. You can download it from the GitHub, fully compiled, ready to go. So there's the GitHub address for anyone who's not familiar with it, can't Google. Anyone want more time? Payloads. So we can do anything with our payload. Uh, the one I was working on last night was uh, Mimi Cats to determine whether I needed a 64 or 32 bit version, download the correct version, pull out all the passwords shoot them to me in an email, I got it on my device, I can pull it out, I can type in the password right then and there. I've, I'm in in like 30 seconds or less. So we can also make it where it emails them, shoots us off to us, opens up a persistent listener, phones home, whatever we want to do. The payload can be anything because there's absolutely no checking within the USB design. It was designed, uh, it really came out in 1996, I was testing USB, and we didn't have any devices. We, it was there, we were supposed to test something with it, we had to install it in Windows 95 OSR 2, but we didn't have anything, so we ended up rigging up a set of USB speakers. Well, 
that's worthless because we got an audio port on the back. Why do we want that? You know? So it was a progression, and in, in 1996, security mentality didn't exist like it does today. So we're still operating on old, old technology. So the, the simpler the payload, the better. Um, you know, I got a little complicated between my 32, 64 bit, everything, I bricked them. But bricking them is not the end of the road. If you brick it, that's okay. Because you can, you can short the pins, get back into boot mode, you're okay. So the way it works, DriveCom sets the device into boot mode. Once it's in boot mode, you can retrieve the flash, send a flash, anything to it. So you flash the firmware, then to test, cycle the power. It boots up, it's gonna do what you've designed it to do, hopefully, otherwise you have to go through the next method. Short the pins, which automatically puts the hardware into boot mode. Flash the firmware, test, rinse, slather, repeat. And as many times as you wanna keep doing it, and as much patience as you have, you can do anything you want with these USB. Okay, so so how do we protect ourselves? Uh, well, one way is uh, you come to events like this and you find out what's going on. So that's that's the first thing. Well, you could uh, you could choose to disable the USB. A few years back, it's been quite a few years now, the VA tried this. They thought it would be brilliant. I'm going to disable the USB. And they actually even went to the extent on some of these of gluing a little uh, piece of plastic into the USB so you couldn't use it. Well, what happens when you do that? It drives people crazy. Uh, it makes them pretty mad. They're going to find a workaround. So those kinds of activities tend to send people to using uh, the Dropbox or they still have a need to transfer some big files, right? Uh, antivirus. Um, well, antivirus isn't going to help very much, at least today. Nobody's really got anything that detects bad USB. Um, you can have endpoint protection, right? You, you can... Uh, well, you can do the, the simple things that we probably all do a lot of, removing PowerShell. You can do some hardware encryption. That kind of stuff helps. But physical security is the most important thing. Uh, you know, I, Jason talked a lot about what he does in physical security. But that is, that's the most important thing. If I, if I have a laptop, if I have a desktop, and I'm taking good care of it, from a physical standpoint, somebody's not going to just easily slip a USB in that that I'm not aware of into it. But I can't be there all the time if it's a desktop. If it's a laptop, maybe I can have it with me all the time. Uh, or maybe somebody could uh, potentially trick me into putting in a USB. Uh, and so that's why it's so important to have that security awareness and training. And what what's a, what is it about all these? Does anybody think of any other ways that we could protect? Yes. Okay, user education. So um, I love that answer. Let me expound on that a little bit. So when we first uh, concocted this idea of, hey, let's uh, kind of take the work uh, that's been done already and see what we can build with that and what we can divine. Uh, we didn't know it was going to be so hard to get an environment stood up and everything that it was going to take. So we fully intend to actually go right there. This this is going to become a platform eventually of security awareness and training where we build these and uh, place them strategically in places and have people plug them in. And then the goal would be to have... Um, you know, be able to show people, well, you you know, you found this, you did this, and send them to a little uh, website where they fill out a form, social engineer them a little bit more, and see how much, how much data, and w kind of walk them down the tree. How much can we get from them? Okay, first they plugged it in. Okay, 
Maybe they didn't receive one in a manila envelope on their desk with their name on it, but maybe they found it in the parking lot or whatever. And we just help walk through that with the eventual goal of uh, giving them back their data that we that, that we get them to input into some forms and things. So that's the platform, and that's where we're headed with that. Any other thoughts of, on ways to protect? Alternative storage? Okay. So the little uh, like flash drives and the little chips that you can put in computer or, you know, your watch or your phone or um, those kinds of things. Okay, those are going to be probably picked apart and they're going to have some of the same challenges, right? It's a good idea, though. Uh, one of the things that, that we noticed as we were going through this is uh, is the chip manufacturers are changing fast enough. So the O3 uh, that we have, a pretty good platform already worked out, is, um, you know, that's that was older technology. The O7s are, are more prevalent now, and it takes a little bit of time to figure it out. So they try and stay ahead of the curve in the engineering by by continuing to spit out new chips, right? So that, that helps a little bit. We probably would suggest to them eventually that they maybe not uh, put all their tech specs up. Maybe not every of all of them. Any other thoughts on protection? Yep. Yes, you can use DriveCom to determine the chipset and the firmware that it has. Um, and they have serial numbers in the firmware, but there are so many different USB manufacturers that you can't check them all. You know, you would have to create this big monstrous database of that and then somehow get it, you know, at the end point where somebody's plugging it in. So it's really not possible what we need to see are signatures on the firmware, checksum signatures, you know, where we're MD5ing something. We're doing something to verify that that is a valid, legitimate firmware on that device. No, you can't, because I can take this device and make your machine believe you just plugged in a keyboard and that this text that it's now getting fed it com is coming from the keyboard, as if you're the user entering this. Because I can emulate a keyboard, I can emulate a mouse, I can emulate a hard drive, I can emulate any USB device. USB doesn't have that differentiation. In the USB handshake, when you plug that device in, the system says, you've just plugged in a device, what are you? And the device says, I'm a keyboard. And the system says, great, here's some keyboard drivers, rock on. There's absolutely no way to check it, no way to determine what device you actually plugged in is legitimate. It, you can literally plug it in and it can say, I'm a USB speaker and start feeding it what it believes are audio and you can execute PowerShell and rock on because you're just emulating that device and you're sending the same information that that device would. It's not e even egressing there. I mean, you do have egress points along the firewall and intrusion detection, stuff like that. But the, I'm sorry, the question was, can you do some sort of uh, endpoint control to that? Um, yes, you can. You can stop the egress of data. You can stop, you know, and, and notify those type things. But inherently in USB, you can't stop that firmware from infecting that machine. So yes, you can be notified, 
that that machine attempted to send this out. But realistically, what is the response time on that? You know, uh, logs have to be gone through, somebody has to be notified, somebody has to go down to that machine. It, you know, it, it's a huge vulnerability because no matter what you plug in, it, there's no way to stop that firmware from infecting that host. Yes, sir? Following up on the idea, I mean, when, when you plug it in, you could have UI pop up and say, hey, do you need to plug a keyboard in? But the key devices can see that they give you keystrokes. Sometimes that pops up and I read it. It's, it's already over. over. It, it only took this, you know, a couple of months to figure out that it was that it was a lot of Well, this is true. It's well, but I can, I, can, I can make it where it doesn't pop up anything. The user will think, oh, well, that one's just dead. And they're going to sit there and say, oh, well, didn't work. Um, maybe my computer's slow. They give it a couple more seconds. They're just in there waiting, waiting. Then they pull it out. They throw it away. It doesn't matter. They're already infected at that point. Okay. Yeah, in, in your old USB devices, you can sit down, fire up DriveCom, plug it in, and in two seconds you know whether that one's a Fizon or uh, the O3 or an O7 or what. And and then I just throw them in different piles. This one's an O3, this one's an O7. I now have boxes for them. I have them labeled because I know the O7's coming. We're going to be able to use that one. I got a few thousand O7s and, you know, a few hundred O3s and so so, uh, so another vector is how many people in here have one of those nice little uh, USB wireless uh, mice? Yes. Okay. So you take the little dongle, right, and you plug it in, and it's a USB. Also, another delivery mechanism, and that one's nice because you're really not expecting to do much with it, other than be able to use your mouse. So I plug it in, and my mouse works. And now it's even a lot better. It used to be you have to go through some gyrations for it to discover it and download software. Oh, one of the old ones, if downloading software includes downloading malware, right? But um, so you plug in that little thing. Now it's you're not a person that's done that is not expecting to interact with it other than the the mouse. So wow, the mouse works, does all the things I'm expecting, and it's just sitting there doing whatever else we might want to make it do. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Can I do? Can I sit for long? Okay. Go ahead. All right. So, uh, hardware encryption. Here's something we came across recently uh, that might be somewhat helpful. Um, Jason's calculating all the social engineering ways past this already. I can see the wheels <laughs> turning. Um, but this 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 kind of a physical uh, physical security would help, right? So you could put a, a key code on it, and uh, of course you could put a lot of these around in the parking lot that have no pins. So great fun. As well, or deliver them in the, the Manila envelope. I just love that one. I don't know why I love it so much? Yeah, this device is not impervious to the the uh, USB vulnerability, but if I were to carry a, a device in my pocket, this is what I would carry because you have to enter the PIN number to activate it. So I know that if someone got a hold of my device, they're not going to infect my device without my knowledge, without me being present, something like that. 
and they're also not going to get my data out. Uh, this has hardware encryption. Uh, it has a battery in it. it. It maintains, you know, everything. And then you lock it, and you have to have the pin to unlock it. If you were to, like Dan said, put a bunch of these out in the parking lot, you know, somebody would sit there and punch the buttons a million times trying to figure out the code, even though it has no code, you could utilize this as an attack vector, but it would protect your data you know, if you were to use one of these. I'm going to put it in the parking lot, and the code's going to be one, two, three, four. Right? That's the first one. That's the first one we're going to try. That's right. <clears throat> Okay, so um, any other questions or comments? <clears throat> so that would be something to do, okay, but like I said, the simplest payload is the best. Because once you start getting overly complicated, you have more variables for failure. And so if you want it to work 100% of the time, every time, you need to know your target, uh, whether it's Windows, Mac, Linux, you know, you need to know that target, 32-64-bit, uh, those type things. Or you have to stick to a very simple payload of we open it up, we launch this persistent listener, and we connect back. And the instant that you can connect back, you can take over that host and own it, and then start working out from that host, you know, so on and so forth. And, and honestly, I believe that if you took a handful of these and put them, say, in the bowl, like Jason suggested, out there, and it, you couldn't keep up fast enough answering back those hosts to own them with how fast people would put it in. And that's just a super simple payload of, you know, open it up, open this listener, and connect back. I tried to get a overly complicated because I wanted to do some demonstrations where, you know, we would ask for a volunteer and say, hey, will you plug this in? You know, we're going to steal all your passwords. And, and we would have found somebody to volunteer, for sure. Uh, back here. In general, it's still USB. The, the inherent flaw is USB, period. I mean, it doesn't matter the manufacturer or anything. It has firmware on it. That firmware has to talk to the host, and they have to have a USB handshake. And there is nothing inherently built in the USB standard at all to validate anything. So it doesn't matter what device it is, as long as somebody wants to and is persistent enough to break that down and reverse engineer their firmware and determine where it sits on the NAND and how it's put in there and what, what bytes they can take away and what bytes they can use from that original firmware, it's vulnerable. Just, I mean, it's just inherent. Yes, sir. You just got owned. And strip their passwords off on the way and, 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 and send it via Gmail to some obscure account. Sure, absolutely. Everybody should do it. Anyone else? So that, well, we'd like to thank our our uh, our friends and colleagues at CompuNet for sponsoring. Thank you.